let's everybody make sure that we are as a collective bringing value to the table in the home. Our voice wasn't really being heard like a Good Morning America. You know, not everyone can be on top of their game all the time. Hi there, welcome to the Mental Balance Podcast. I'm your host, Vidhi. After working in tech in the Silicon Valley for a few years, I'm now trying to climb the entrepreneurship path with Antar, a journey that is making me learn a lot about my South Asian immigrant identity, and I honestly have toyed with it a bunch. So my goal with this podcast is to see counsels from the people I admire, and I hope you benefit too. So in this episode, we talk with Nirja Patel, a PR icon in the South Asian community who's been at the forefront of a lot of trending campaigns, rising influencers, and community events. Personally, I've seen her authentic voice through her social media and Instagram. So I really wanted to chat with her. So get ready for a super motivating conversation. Hey, Nature, it's so awesome to have you here today. Hi, Vidhi. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor. I'm very excited to talk to you. Awesome. So I, I just realized I woke up this morning and I opened Instagram and I saw the news about you contributing to Good Morning America for the API Heritage Month. That is so exciting. Thank you. It was it was amazing. I have done quite a bit of work with Good Morning America recently, and I just get really excited about um, any time that they do any sort of a story that really highlights our community. Um, AAPI is so huge, and you know I'm really grateful to all of these big platforms that are really shining light um, on our community in various ways and fashion, like how fun. And so I have done work with South Asian New York Fashion Week and a client I had previously um, called Ross. And so, you know, they when they were talking about fusion fashion, that was some of the uh, things that we contributed to. Yeah, no, that sounds like a lot of fun. API Heritage Month, I think the only way I found to contribute was to write LinkedIn articles, but it's so great to see that icons like you are out there talking about our culture and things that we do on spaces like Good Morning America. It's honestly something I look forward to. Like, that's the news I want to wake up to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that is a lot of the work that I'm trying to do is really just get our community into the big spaces and um, talk about it and all of the different elements in food and fashion, skincare, beauty. I mean, whatever it may be, you know, we have we have uh, we're here now. And so um, I love to be on these big platforms and sort of, you know, talk about all of the different things that we're doing. Nice. Okay, so then let's go back to what you said. You said you were born in Mathura and then you got married to a Patel. So when did you move to the U.S.? Oh, I moved to the U.S. very young. I moved to the U.S. when I was seven years old. Um, I grew up in Minnesota. That's where I went to high school, to college. And then I moved to New York in my 20s um, for a job at a company that I was really excited about. It was in fashion. And I thought, like, how cool to be working in New York City in fashion. But then I really did not like my job. And uh, I did it for a couple of years. And then the summer I was about to move back, um, I met my husband, a Patel. <laughs> and we have now been married for 18 years. And so, um, you know, that was how I really ended up in New York. And when we had uh, my son, who's now 15, right then is when I started my PR company. So my PR company is also turning 15 this year. So you said you moved when you were seven. And before that, you lived in Mathura. So what was the experience like? You know, I don't remember my childhood so much because I was so young when I was there. But any memory I have of India is just with all my cousins. Like we lived in this massive home with extended family, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. And it's all I remember just growing up, playing in our veranda and fighting with my cousins and celebrating festivals with them. Me having dinner at my aunt's house or at my Babo's house, who was my grandma. Um, and by house, I mean, it's the same house, just different portions of the home. And it was like, we all just lived together and it was amazing. Moving here was, I think it was just lonely at first because you know, you're know you not living in such a big home, but so many people, eight of us moved here at the same time. We lived with my maternal grandmother, uh, grandparents here. And so it was a lot of us in one home. We moved out fairly fast. I think we only lived in that um, with my grandparents for about six months and then moved into an apartment. So it was just very different. It was a little bit lonely 
But I mean, my mom's side of the family here is also very large. So we quickly did get all of that family around us. Every Sunday, my grandma had everybody over. And like all of a sudden, the life I had in India was sort of the life I had here. It was just different people, different language, bit of a different culture. I learned most of my English through watching Sesame Street <laughs> um, and just a lot of shows and stuff like that. And, you know, I don't, maybe I just have like bad long-term memory, but like, luckily I don't remember being harassed or bullied for, for who I was very much, even though my sister and I were really the only people of color in our, in our community. I mean, Minnesota was not very diverse, you know, that many years ago. That's amazing that, I mean, you can get perfect in that. And when you say like 15 people meeting every weekend, that just sounds like family back in India. Like, yeah, when them. they said family get together, it was not like, oh, six people. It's like, oh, like 25 people are coming to my grandma's house. And that was just family, you know, <laughs> so yeah, it was wonderful community family. And that's very important to me. And, you know, I'm very blessed here. Um, having my in-laws and, and my brother-in-law's family nearby, because that is important to me that my kids also sort of grow up with that. I mean, we don't all live together, but they are nearby and we do try to spend time together and they are close to their cousins. And that's really important to me because it was a huge part of my upbringing. Okay. So then basically you moved here and then you met your husband in New York um, and you didn't like your first job and then you got two babies at once. How did you manage that? Honestly, it all goes back to what I was saying about community and about family. My um, in-laws helped a ton. My husband is a very hands-on dad. When I left my job with, with the company that moved me to New York, I worked at a television station and I was doing PR and marketing for them on a daily basis. And then I started hosting an on-air show. So I would go on shoots nights and weekends. Um, and then when I had my son, I realized that whole lifestyle was not really conducive to being a new mom. So I left it all together. Ironically, PR was, is like an accidental career for me. I did not have the intention of starting my PR company. I had no idea what I was doing. And I have this great friend who had called me and he's like, Nirja, I landed this amazing role in the reboot of 90210. His name is Manish Leal. And he's like, can you help me spread the word? And I told him, I'm like, Nisha, I've not written a press release. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And he was like, I'll help you. And we sort of wrote this press release together and we pitched it and it got picked up everywhere. And the media loved it to be able to get this news on a South Asian actor who was, you know, up and coming at the time. And, um, and they kind of were like, well, do you have more stories? I'm like, I don't have any more stories. <laughs> and so, and, and just like that, you know, the, the PR business sort of took off from, you know, one recommendation to another. And that's how it, it really grew. It was hard at first because being a stay home mom after being around so many, you know, different things when I was in the television world, it was very lonely, but I had a lot of help and somehow we got through that tough time. And as, my son grew, my business grew. And, you know, I, I, I asked for help when I needed it because I, I can't do it alone. Yeah, no, that's a big one. I feel a lot of us, especially in our community, the South Asian community struggle to ask for help and to be able to do that as a mom and then grow your business. That sounds, that sounds awesome. The fact that you did that, but so when you got started, how was that uphill battle like as a female founder like a south asian female founder you know the south asian female founder aspect wasn't that challenging because our community um back then there was a lot more indian media that was present i mean at this point especially since covid a lot of them have closed shop um but they were very supportive um, I don't think there was really anybody in this space to be able to provide them, you know, news. They were getting a lot of news that was from India, but not gen but not necessarily about the people here. So they were very supportive. I think where I didn't get support, where I'm getting it now, is really sharing those South Asian stories onto the mainstream, like a Good Morning America. Like our voice wasn't really being heard because there was not a lot of representation at those platforms. We now have people in those spaces that understand how much our culture is valued and what we're bringing to the table and want to tell those stories. So 
I have people I can reach out to that really understand like, hey, let's talk about Indian fashion, you know, and they're in these places that they're like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's put it on the cover of this magazine or let's put it on this, you know, um, morning show. So the challenge there wasn't being the South Asian female. The challenge was just being South Asian at that time. Yeah. All right. So it was just getting a seat on the table, kind of the same. And that's probably gotten easier, but it's taken time. It's taken like 15 years since you started here. For sure. For sure. I mean, now, you know, there's, you know, South Asian executives on almost all of these amazing platforms and running magazines and newspapers and, you know, all of these different media outlets. And it's it's amazing to be able to reach out to them and tell them about something I'm working on because 90 percent of it is all, you know, South Asian founded stories or a South Asian talent. Um, but they know they know the value and, and, and they have, you know, the space to be able to to showcase them. So it's definitely gotten easier, but it's taken some time. <laughs> Yeah, probably you might have gotten a pro at like getting rejections. And oh, for sure. I mean, something if somebody said yes to something, I was like, wait, what? Did you read this carefully? <laughs> so. so when when you got started, how how did you sow the seeds of a PR business? Before it was really like me pitching to them that they're worthy of of having a story be told about them. Um, that was one aspect of it. The second aspect of it was a little bit like when wedding planners started out. It's like can you do it alone? Sure. Like you probably have contacts, but wouldn't you want to centralize it? Wouldn't you want someone that's really controlling the narrative and making sure that, you know, your messaging is the same throughout, that you're saying the right things that are going to grow your audience. And so it was really about like telling people that we're doing these things that are like, oh, well, I can call so-and-so and I can, it's like, let me handle that for you. Um, and you can worry about other things. And this way we can take that that story, that narrative, that message to the next level. So many of the people that I talk to, they're like, oh, I didn't know that your company existed. And it's like, it's always existed. It just didn't exist on Instagram. And there are a lot of people that have done great work pre-social media, you know, and have been very supportive. Um, and so I think that there's, you know, a huge, huge gratitude from me that goes out to those people that, that gave me that platform. Um, even even before they saw what I could do just based on social media. Yeah. So now that you say apps, are, I thought Instagram had always been around. And when you pointed out, I just realized, yeah, like Facebook, Internet or anything like growing as such. So probably we, it was just television and newspapers and magazines that was used as a medium for PR. And now it's social media. So it's yeah. I mean, PR back then and marketing bag is like flyers and like who's who's doing flyers and you know like it was it was a lot more of that kind of stuff and now it's like we're in a digital era and everything's different yeah and is it also correct to assume that when you started out um not a lot of people wanted to go out there and like open up and talk about themselves considering that maybe you're a south asian or a minority and now there are more people who are opening up because of representation and want their stories to be heard out there yes definitely i think people didn't have the confidence and they also you know would start something and not really um finish it and then people were telling stories people were doing it was it was in very select categories it was like an entertainment and it was in food and now there's all these amazing beauty brands. There's all of these other societal, like social, like conversations. Like we can talk about, we can talk about mental health. There was no mental health podcast for South Asians 15 years ago. Um, you know, so just the platforms just didn't exist. And people just talked about food or fashion. And there's so much more to us than those two things. So much more to us and so much more that we go through. Oh, definitely. Yeah, now that you said go through and uh, I see you mentioned confidence. How do you handle confidence as a South Asian female or how did you do that for the past 20 years or so? It's funny you ask that. I just had this conversation with someone um, recently and you wouldn't believe the confidence I have I have gained or I have, you know, sort of felt uh, that I finally am, am stepping into in the past three years compared to the 15 years, I didn't have that confidence. I remember going like, especially during COVID, I thought I was going to shut my business down because people weren't doing events. 
you know, no one was really launching anything new. I was like, maybe this is the end of near to PR. And I remember a friend of mine invited me to an event and I was like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to know anyone. And I went there um, and I asked him if I could bring my husband. I don't take my husband anywhere. He doesn't, he's, he's in the finance world. He's not in this. And I was like, I don't know who I'm going to talk to. And is it okay if I bring my husband along? And she said, sure. And I just thought I was going to go and stand there in a corner. I was so just really like my anxiety for some reason had gone through the roof during, during COVID. And I just felt like I didn't know the community anymore, but the way that it was, I guess everybody was feeling that same way. Um, And then I started doing more and more work and, you know, this whole imposter syndrome um, where I'm like, Oh, they really follow my work. They really like this. And then I started really owning it to be like, you know what? I'm doing something good for the community. I'm helping people. I'm helping share stories. And I, my confidence really grew. And I think it shows um, because honestly, there's nothing yuckier than like not having confidence and letting people show how, you know, or any signs of desperation or anything like that. Like confidence really exudes in, in a lot of great ways and shows you in a very positive light. Yeah. So then you just picked yourself up after that event and you were like, I need to own what I'm doing and just get out there. Yeah. And I think after a while, you're just like, okay, I can't always be like, no, they're not talking about me. And like, you know what, maybe, maybe there is something good that I'm doing. Maybe I can go to these events and people are inviting me for me not to fill the room. I mean, I had all of these crazy thoughts before and I was not very confident. Um, And it took me some time. And I think my whole persona has changed now um, ever since I've been like, okay, I'm going to own up to the fact that, you know, I'm doing good work. I think for personal reasons, I'm going to ask you, like, how do you do that? Do you have any tips only? Because I struggle. Some days I have a lot of confidence when I get out to these events to talk to people. And some days I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to go there and do. I'm more in my head. Once I'm there, I'm still a bit lost. And it's like, okay, I need to wake myself up. But it's too late because the event is almost over. (laughs) Um, I think the other thing is it's okay to have days like that. You know, not everyone can be on top of their game all the time. That's okay. You know? Um, but if you're not feeling confident, like on a regular basis, I think you have to really, really ask yourself, like, what is it that you feel like you're not worthy of? Is it of someone's time? Is it of the work that you're doing? Is it like, are you, do you feel like you're just taking up space? Um, and really ask yourself like, but people don't say that about me. So why do I think that about myself? You know, and really like have those conversations with the people that do believe in you and that you're doing good things and you know you're adding value because I think listening to other people talk about you sometimes does help you get through a lot of that self-doubt yeah okay that's very insightful probably going to look up some reviews and stuff that I've gotten so far to feel better I mean I'm I feel like I've just talked to you for a short time like you're amazing and I feel very connected and you you know your smile and the way you talk makes me feel good you're really good at what you're doing like you're not intimidating me. So, you know, so I think you're doing a great job. Yeah, no, thank you so much. That That is very helpful. That makes me feel better. Yeah, so I think I did start with one basic question, which was, have you ever seeked therapy in your life so far? Professional help? No, but I do feel like I rely on my friends and sister for, <laughs> for therapy often. Um, but yeah. professionally, I am going to be soon. Um, there are, you know, a host of things in my 40s that I feel like I'm going through that I want to talk to someone that doesn't know all about me and just that I can focus on certain things. Um, It's also taken me many years to get over the stigma of all of these things that we kind of grew up with and really understanding that it's going to benefit me. So I am starting very soon. So it looks like there were some hindrances before from you accepting maybe that you need wanted to get help professionally and now that you're like getting through it you just want to get out and do it yeah exactly I think you know um the generation before us like they just didn't talk about mental health right like we didn't talk about mental health it wasn't like any resources that were given to us like it just was never a thing and so I think that that stigma 
And part of it is stigma. Part of it is really just not knowing. Like what I'm going through, is that normal? Is it anxiety? Is it depression? Is it like, what is, and now it's like, okay, I can come, I know what these feelings are. I know there's someone out there to help me. It's exactly like if my stomach hurts, I'll go see someone. If my if I can't see, I'll go see someone. But, you know, if I'm feeling all of these things, there is help out there. And the more I talk about it, the more I understand how to navigate it and, and use the tools that they tell me it's going to get better. Yeah, honestly, it still isn't like uh, the fact that I am building something in well-being and mental health when I have this conversation with a lot of South Asian adults or people in the family, they're all like, oh, is, is, is that a thing? It's something of just this generation of yours that is needed. And I'm like, no, you guys need it too. It's just that it, the knowledge wasn't there and we don't accept it. And, and it's exactly those words you said, is that a thing? It's almost like they belittled it. You know, like, oh, what is this nonsense? Like, oh, you know, and it's like, it is a thing. And it's a very important thing. It's a very huge thing that people go through, you know, and we are going through it probably because of all this in your face technology and all of this other stuff that were around that their generation wasn't, but every generation has something, you know, so I'm sure there were things as part of their upbringing that was probably not normal or healthy and they could have benefited from it i wish i could put all of them in therapy that would be my ideal dream yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> like people can ask for help and help and like accept that help but exactly yeah, yeah from here i'm actually going to take a quick segue and talk about this element that we have in the podcast which is auntie wants to know so basically what i mean by that is what is the most peculiar thing an auntie in your life has asked you, which has bummed you out or where you've been like, what, what is she talking about? And to give an example, I have always been asked about my weight. And I think the most peculiar question I got during my wedding was that, oh, did you not think about losing weight before planning for your wedding? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. That's a good question, auntie. You just met me. But yeah. Anything that you remember? Yeah, um, generally it's been about, and, and it's crazy that it's from our community aunties, about my color. And that's, and it's always because my sister is a little bit lighter than me. And it was always like, oh, well, your sister's so light. Why are you so dark? First of all, does it matter? And secondly, it's not anything I can control. Um, but my color has always, and, and maybe if my sister and I were the exact same shade of brown, you know, it wouldn't have mattered because we're all in the same brown community, but because she's several shades, I mean, she's a little bit lighter and she's a little bit taller. It was always like, oh, poor you, you know? And so it wasn't like necessarily weight, but it's always been about the color. And even my parents, I was like, kind of upset when my son was born. I have a son and a daughter now, but um, they were just like, and my husband's really like, the, oh, thank God. Thank God that he, you know, that the kids are more his shade and not mine. I'm like, would it have mattered? Um, so I think it's the color for me that's always been a, a, a topic that I feel like people tiptoe around, but I've heard it so many times at this point. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Exactly. No, that's the reason like I put it as a, it's honestly not a fun element because it's something that all of us, especially females go through and it's always based on our physical appearance, but I want to laugh about it and normalize it so that anyone who feels like totally bogged down by an auntie asking them a question, they can understand that the aunties just need to be ignored. They're there for a reason and they're there to be ignored. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, you know, before it's marriage, it's weight. It's when are you having kids? When are you having the second kid? It's there's, there's always something. There's always something. Yeah. So something that I found super interesting while researching about you was somewhere you mentioned in your work that you like to reconcile traditional values with the demands of a modern lifestyle. And I was curious to learn more about how you actually do that in your campaigns and in your work. I think it's a uh, very complex uh, traditional values in the South Asian community really emphasize family and cultural practices, roles and responsibilities. Um, but the modern day is so much about individuals and self care. And it's about, you know, navigating all this fast technology. So I think we have to be very flexible 
Um, we have to learn to adapt. And I think like for the campaigns, it's really about how do we get the messaging across about having traditional values, but the way, but in the way that the generation of today is going to value that, right? We can't, we can't be like, hey, family values are about us taking care of our in-laws and the woman doing the work and the husband getting going money. No, family values are still there, but they're more about let's everybody make sure that we are as a collective bringing value to the table in the home and that we're all treated as equals, you know, that because someone is earning more, you know, in money while someone else is contributing more on the family front. And how do we get that messaging across in terms, you know, in any sort of branding or campaign that life is about being equal? We can't, you know, I have a, a client that was a toy brand, right? All of our branding for toy brands can't be directed towards moms. There's a lot of stay at home dads. And so really making sure that let's we're still talking family values, but we're talking families where it can be, you know, where the mom is the breadwinner, where there's two moms or there's two dads. Really just kind of, you know, making sure that the value is there, um, but then it's presented in a way that it's palatable for our current environment. Yeah. OK, I see exactly what you mean. That, that example is great. And honestly, I feel gender equality is still sort of a problem in the community. Like not everyone accepts the fact that females and men should do the same things at the same time. They can share the chores and the burdens. So it's fascinating that you make sure that the correct audience gets targeted and then there's equality and other messaging being passed on along with our values at the same time. If I got all of the examples correctly. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, listen, I I am very proud of the household that we have. I mean, my husband is very senior at his work and, you know, he gets a lot of respect there and he has a lot of responsibilities. But when he's home, he's dad, you know, he's helping me do the dishes and he's taking out that garbage before he gets on the train in the morning. And, you know, like there's not uh, there's like everyone is pitching in. It doesn't matter what you're doing outside of the house, but everyone is equal in here. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm glad that we push for all of those things even. And I didn't even realize that those are things that come into consideration when you have to push for campaigns because, yeah, those are things that you have to think about. Like a toy doesn't have to go only to the mom. It has to go to the dad too. They are right. Also- and I mean, if you look at like beauty brands right now, they're not all targeted to women. There's a lot of guys in the makeup space. And so, again, like we just have to make sure that, you know, we're talking inclusivity. We're talking about... um really just talking to mass markets and and not just, you know, putting our assumptions, oh, only women are going to use this or only so-and-so is going to use this, especially in a marketing campaign, you'll be canceled like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you've also been, your background is in fashion and I see that now you have a lot of clients in the fashion and lifestyle industry. Say through your campaigns or the clients that you work with, have you ever seen that there have been any inequalities that you've had to address, especially if they're South Asian and something that you've had to push towards to get them out there into the market and have their voices be heard, especially if it's related to mental health at any point? Yeah, I mean, um, not necessarily in mental health, but I think it's it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, that um, really making sure that they are pushed for the work that they're doing and not because someone wants to have them on their panel or put their product in a magazine or talk about a founder to check the box of any sort of like API initiative or to have like, you know, a a person of color or anything like that. It's like, no, let's talk about their work. Let's talk about who they are and what they stand for and not lead with, it's a South Asian woman. It's just, she's a woman. It's a woman that's doing great work. It's a founder that's doing great work and not necessarily put those sort of like words between that. We're like, well, we're saying it's a South Asian woman because we don't think most South Asian women are going to do this. Because as soon as we talk about something like it's a woman or she's South Asian, we're, we're adding a bit of a handicap to who they really are and what they're doing. Yeah, that's profound. Like you're basically not wanting to put a box around someone just because of their identity. Exactly. Yeah. And then even like other work that's being done by companies, you know, now it's uh, we go back to AAPI or Diwali, like all of these big corporations are 
are celebrating it, which is amazing, but that let's do it for the right purpose. Don't do it to check the box. Don't do it to say that, hey, we did it, but we didn't do it in the right way. Don't just, you know, order Indian food at your company and call it Diwali. Like there are so many other elements that we can do um, that really showcase what the holiday is about, what the culture is about, what is the meaning. Um, and so I think it's really important to continue educating um, all of these people, whether it's through media or whether it's through events, just really, what does it mean to be South Asian? What does it really mean to, to celebrate AAPI and all of the differences in the, same, in the community that we've built? Yeah, no, that's well put. That happens a lot in a lot of tech companies where they, are, they order Indian food and it's like, oh, it's Diwali for you. And you're like, no, there's much more to Diwali. So looking ahead, what are your hopes and aspirations for mental health advocacy with the South Asian community? And how do you think the platform and Nija PR that you've created can contribute to that? My hope is continued awareness um, and education for mental health, self-care, again, reducing the stigma around it. And I want to continue to talk about it and share about it more openly. Like, I mean, yes, near PR is a platform. I also have the personal platform, like even Instagram, where, you know, people always think that life is just all glamorous stresses and red carpets and fun events, but it's not. Um, and I want to always be open. Um, last year, I was doing PR for South Asian New York Fashion Week. It was four days. In the middle of that, I had an MRI scheduled for a brain aneurysm that I have. And I made sure I went and I made sure that I also put that in the midst of all of the fashion week stuff, because that is real life. And it's very important to make sure you prioritize self-care. It's more important than anything else that that you'll do. Our house was broken into last summer. I shared about that because, again, everything you see on Instagram from most people is just all these pretty little things. You know, I'm very involved in the community, am a part of events, but even me, like in my 40s, I feel a lot of anxiety seeing things that people are doing because everything always looks perfect and it's not, you know? And so I try to use my platform to really tell people that like everything you see is not as rosy and as pretty little things as you see it. There are realities you know, we were robbed in the middle of a beautiful vacation. We were, you know, I did have to go through an MRI um, that I always, that I go through yearly and I made sure I did it, even though it was in the middle of a busy week. Yeah, I, I hope everything's clear in the MRI. And you said you have to do Yes, that. yes, everything. We're, we're good. We're moving on from the burglary and everything's fine with that. So it's part of life. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, but no, that's a very real life example of like balancing life, things that happen, mishaps and other stuff you have to take care of and also continue with your work. But that's commendable. Like you did four days of New York Fashion Week and then also balance your physical health at the same time and also be a mom. So yeah, kudos to you. For Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. On that note, I realized that we never spoke about your own self-care routine and your own ways of balancing your mental health. So do you have any rituals and routines that you follow? Um, I'm getting better at it every day. My my work is such that I work with a lot of clients that have a nine to five and then they pursue their passion project in their five to nine. And so they tend to set up calls and meetings in the evenings or weekends, um, whereas my company near to PR for me is my nine to five. And so I am just getting better at saying no. Otherwise, I end up just working 24 seven. And I didn't used to because I used to be so afraid that like, well, what if they think I'm not accessible, and then they won't hire me? Or what if I upset them? And, you know, again, still trying to balance everybody. But um, I have gotten better at prioritizing myself and my family and saying no. And, and sometimes it's seasonal, like the weather's so great. Um, I'll push a phone call till much later so I can go on a walk with my husband, you know, after dinner, because we really like to do that, push a meeting to another day, if I can go catch a softball game, I love watching my daughter play softball. Um, oh. So it's not like I'm at a spa every day. And that's what makes me happy. It's just these small things really, really help me stay grounded and not like give me burnout. Like last year, I didn't do all of these things. And I had, I felt real burnout. 
And I felt burnout to a point where I wasn't even happy with clients or family. And I had done it all to myself. And so this year I'm getting much better at it. No, I exactly know what you mean by burnout. I just got laid off like back in February and I was happy that I got laid off because I was so bored by the end of it. And I was like, I'm done. I cannot deal with work all the time. So yeah, it's glad that you already found change that is helping you know that this is not going to help you burn out or like this is what is going to make you happy. In the yeah. Moment. Yeah, I know. And everyone's like, oh, you know, you, it, vacations and, and spas and all of those, they, they sound great. That It's not things you can do on a daily basis. So even finding those small things on a daily basis that can, you know, just help you even balance out day to day, I think are, are important. Yeah, no, I, I think that's very well put. We think vacations and spas, they get moved around for like being the self-care treatments. But I feel honestly, they're just like short term dopamine injections yeah. that can work more, but then you get drained out yet so it's not a balance yeah and I think the other thing like going to so many events I was like eating really unhealthy you know so I really started taking eating healthier cutting out alcohol just just even those two things and and it's made me feel so much better I'll like eat before I go to an event so I'm not eating the same chicken tikka and like samosas and this and that so that's another thing that I've really started doing is just really focusing on eating better I'm trying to get off alcohol too. So, okay. How long have you been off of it? Or is it just... Oh, I'm not off it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I'll have like a glass of wine with dinner on a Saturday night for sure. Okay. Um, yeah. but, but then that's it. You know, like I don't need that second glass of wine. I don't need to like, you know... Like I love, especially in the summertime, I'm like addicted to seltzer. Like just LaCroix, just, you know, all of these sparkling waters. And it kind of just gives you that little bit of like, cold biz that you want to like sit outside with and so just kind of you know and I think we are in a major like shift there's so many people that are just not drinking like I see at events like everyone is kind of going to towards mocktail seltzer iced tea and I think I, I, like everyone is really kind of conscious about a healthier lifestyle I'm totally with it but yeah I think on that note this was so much fun Nirja I had amazing fun on this podcast with you and there was so much to learn i'm sure everyone who's going to listen is going to learn a ton about what it takes to do pr behind the scenes and all the things that you've done so far in your journey so thank you for coming thank you so much for having me this was fun and you are wonderful um i really appreciate you asking me and um you know i would love to chat with you anytime awesome take care all right Vidhi. thank you so much bye 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 Hope you enjoyed this conversation. You can listen in on any of your audio directories at Spotify or even Apple Podcasts. And if you're excited to see what both of us were looking like while discussing this conversation, come watch us on YouTube. Make sure you follow us on Instagram. Thank you. Bye.